Why don't we go ahead and call the Citizen Advisory Committee meeting for Wednesday, March 13th, 2024 to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, if we could do roll call, please. Sure. Francesca Normington. Rosemary Chora. Present. Jeff Arbor. Present. Dickie Fernandez. Present. Dean Fisher. Here. Daniel Baum. Here. Cindy Brenneman. Thank you. Annette Watson. Vice Chair Michael Toe. President. Well, Daniel, can I help you? And Chair Sue Lester. Here. Uh, um, I would like to open public comment. We put in a um, work request order. Oh. Any public comments? No, Madam Chair. Okay, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Let's jump into um, item one under section B, approve the citizen advisory committee minutes from the January 10th, 2024 meeting. Did everybody have a chance to read them? Somebody like to make a motion? Move to approve the minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Opposed? Anybody abstaining from voting? No, nope. guess we're good. Number two, draft solid waste rate study. <laughs> Good evening, Chair and Committee members. So as our general man manager indicated, um, the district retained NBS Government Finance Group to conduct a solid waste rate study. Jerry Mitchmargo with NBS is here tonight to go over the study and the recommended rate adjustment. Um, following the presentation, Jeremy and staff are available to answer any questions. And Jeremy, thank you for being with us. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Marissa, and thank you, Scott. Uh, good evening to members of the committee. Um, as Marissa said, my name is Jeremy Tamargo. I'm a member of the MBS Utility Rate Group. Uh, unfortunately, I have a presentation here. Am I, am I able to have a permission to share my screen here via the Zoom. It looks like that's currently disabled. I'm sorry, Jeremy. Hang on. I believe I co-hosted. Hang on one second. Let me co-host you. No problem. Okay. You should be good to go. Yep. Perfect. All right. You able to see that on your end? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm going to jump right in here. So this is meant to be a brief overview and companion to the preliminary draft study that was included in the packet this evening. Um, so I'll walk through the agenda here. So um, I'll start at the top, kind of big picture, and talk about the overview of the rate study methodology, such as the process and the goals. Um, and then the next subsequent sections will dig into the three main components of a solid waste rate study, which are the financial plan, the cost of service analysis, and then the rate study results. Um, and then to conclude the presentation, I'll talk about the next steps in the process, as well as uh, both myself and staff will be available to answer any questions that may come up during the course of the presentation. So let's jump in here. Um, so we'll, we'll start at the highest level and talk about an overview of, of rate study and the methodology that we employ. So in terms of purpose and methodology, um, why do we prepare a rate study? So first and foremost, the California Constitution has specific legal requirements in terms of rate setting for utilities. So um, that is known colloquially as Prop 218 in the Constitution there. So we're following the the requirements as written in the Constitution. 
Um, per the Constitution, you're only able to set these utility rates during a five-year rate projection period. So that's why you see this study typically occurring every five years. The last district study was completed in 2019, so we're right on schedule in terms of the timing of the study. And uh, first and foremost, the, the reasoning behind the legislation and preparing the study is to demonstrate the fairness and equity of the customer rates that are being charged as a result. So we'll get into a little bit more detail as the presentation rolls along, but just to give you the three main components, um, what go into a rate study. So the first piece is developing what we call the financial plan. Um, so just like your personal finances for the solid waste utility, we first understand both the sources and the uses of funds in order to determine how much revenue that we need to collect from those rates in order to sustain that enterprise. Once we have that as our, our foundation for the plan, then we do what's called a cost of service analysis. And so that's where we're taking those revenue requirements and we're allocating them to the different customer classes. So we use industry standards as well as the state law. Um, for this specific study, it's a little bit simpler because there is one customer class, the residential customers, in which the service is being provided. And then the third piece is the rate design analysis, and that is where, um, in conjunction with staff, we work together to determine what rate structure will best meet the need of, in this case, the district to collect the rate revenue from each customer class. Before we jump into the specifics on the financial plan, I like to give an overview of this key term, what we call the net revenue requirements. Um, so in determining those costs that need to be recovered from the customer rates, we have this term called net revenue requirement. And so what goes into that, you take your O&M costs that you find in the budget, you add any debt service, so any new or existing debt that's proposed um, over the course of the period, you add in if there's any capital improvement costs, and then you subtract out any of what we call their non-rate revenues. So that would be from licenses, fees, uh, property taxes in the case of the district. And that gives us a number in terms of net revenue, what we need to be collecting on an annual basis in order to be self-sustaining for the funds. Um, in addition to that net revenue requirement, we also consider adequate levels of reserves. So that cash on hand in order to deal with emergencies, in order to smooth out future rate increases in the, in, in the future beyond that five-year period. So those two things are kind of the key considerations that we look at when we're developing that financial plan. And then once we have that foundation and know what we need in terms of that net revenue requirement, what we do is that cost of service analysis. Um, so that's where we're taking those costs on how much it truly costs to serve each type of customer and allocate that amongst the different um, criteria. And typically in a solid waste study, the different allocation factors that we look at are the collection cost, the disposal cost, the cost for your organics, and then the admin and overhead costs. So then the costs based on those four categories are then allocated to each of the customer classes based on their proportional share. And as I said, for the district's case, it's a bit simpler since there is the one residential customer class. So we don't have, for instance, commercial or industrial users, other classes. In terms of the rate study methodology for the rate design, which is the third piece of this, um, really the, the overarching goal is that the rates are proportional to the cost of service. So how much does it actually cost to serve each customer? So um, in addition to the constitution, there's also been a lot of legal cases surrounding Prop 218. Um, and the San Juan Capistrano case that we highlight here in the presentation really um, emphasized that there needs to be a cost basis demonstrated in these studies in order to set your rates. Um, 
And that applies, so that specifically was a court case on tiered water rates, but those basic principles are going to apply to all of your studies where you really need to show the math and the homework behind how you got to that cost basis for your rates. Um, and then other uh, factors that we consider when developing these rates, of course, we want them to be equitable and non-discriminatory, right? Equal for, for all customers receiving the service. Um, there is a key consideration in terms of both the ease of administration from the district side in administering the rates, as well as the customer understanding the charges in terms of the bill that they receive. And then, of course, from a utility perspective, those rates should provide that revenue stability into the future. <laughs> And then finally, specific to this study, um, there were three main um, objectives that we looked at. So as we mentioned, ensuring that those rates cover all the operating and maintenance costs, including what's known as SB 1383 compliance costs, which um, are additional costs and regulation regarding disposal of organics materials. Um, the third or the second piece was maintaining appropriate reserve funds for the district. And then um, the third piece is complying with all those legal requirements of the study in order to set the proposed rates. So now um, in this second section of the presentation, I'm going to get into the specifics of results from the study. So all of this is provided in more detail in the draft report, and we could certainly talk about it further if there's any questions, but I'm just going to provide kind of the high level overview of the highlights. So this financial plan, um, this is a summary actually of the more detailed tables that go into the financial plan. So I apologize, there's a lot of numbers I know even in the summary table, um, but to focus on um, the blue highlight that says net revenue requirements. Um, and so the highlight there is seeing that that number is increasing over the course of the five-year implementation period. I'm going from in the $6 million range at the beginning of the study up to about $8.4 million in terms of that net revenue requirement. If you look at the uh, row right above that, that annual surplus or deficit without any rate increases, you could see by 2627, the district would be running a deficit without any rate increases, which would only um, get larger by the time we're in 28, 29 to approximately 1.6 million as a deficit. So the proposed um, rate adjustments of 5% annually are meant to um, offset that and, and basically um, keep the, the fund to be self-sustaining. Um, so I will provide some, I like the graphics better than necessarily the detail on the table. So the blue are the operating expenses projected out over the five-year period. That black line is showing the revenues under the existing rates. So if there were no adjustments made, you're seeing that, um, again, by fiscal year 27, you would be operating under a deficit, which would only increase um, over the, the outer years of the study. So the green, those revenues under the proposed rate adjustments are meant to keep pace with those increasing costs. <clears throat> the other piece here um, is the reserve target. So right now the district is currently right at the recommended minimum reserve level as per that green line. And so part of this plan is also um, providing a, a sufficient um, reserve target that allows the district to be slight to be increasing that reserve over the course of the five-year study. Um, part of the reason there is that the um, amount of revenue, so if I flip back, you could see that those costs, the difference between the revenues under the proposed rates versus those O&M expenses, that difference between the two is getting smaller over the course of that five-year. Um, so we don't only look at the five-year total projected period. We're also thinking about the 10-year horizon and the 20-year horizon. So building up those reserves over the course of this study period will allow the potential to offset some of those rate increases in the outer years if you're looking at the five to 10-year range and kind of and stabilize out what those projections may look like. 
Um, so that is part of the recommendation of building a up a, a reserve over the course of this five years and not being just at the absolute minimum in terms of the recommendation. So then I'll briefly touch on the cost of service analysis that was performed. Um, so as I talked about, this is a table that just kind of summarizes the math behind the study is we take um, all of the budget is ex budgeted expenses, um, go through the line item budget and allocate those costs to the different allocation factors that we talked about. So collection, disposal, organics, and then the overhead and admin. And so that allows us to um, uh, allocate those costs amongst those different um, factors and get a percent of revenue that should be derived from each of those expense items. And then what we do is we take that projected rate revenue and then adjust it based on the additional rate revenue that we are anticipating from those um, increases, the 5% adjustment. So we do an across the board adjustment in order to get to the, the final numbers in terms of the rate revenues that we're expecting. In terms of how we allocate those functional costs, Collection is the allocation basis is on the number of accounts. So basically the number of accounts that the trucks are going around to collect from. Your disposal costs are directly allocated by the total volume in terms of the waste that is being generated. And then both your organics and your admin is also based on the number of accounts in terms of that allocation basis. And so um, after we do all the homework and the math behind the cost of service piece, then we get into the rate design. And so um, in discussion with staff, we decided that the preferred rate alternative is maintaining the current structure, which is a flat rate for all the residential customers, um, with the caveat that there is also an additional charge for additional carts beyond that uh, standard level of service. And so that flat rate charge um, calculated out based on that new net revenue requirement for 24-25 um, calculates out to 25-24 per month, which is a 4.7% change in the rates. Um, I do have that note there. Um, we talked about the net revenue requirements being an annual 5% adjustment. And so in this first year, the flat rate only adjustment is slightly less than that 5% because it's a true up essentially of the study that was done in 2019. So we we're updating those costs, we we're updating the number of accounts. And so based on truing up that information, that's why we have the 4.7% as the adjustment in the first year. And then in subsequent years, that maximum adjustment is that 5% in line with the annual adjustment to the net revenue. In terms of the preliminary rate design results, um, this graph shows the current rates at the 2410 per month. So um, the proposal is an increase of slightly more than a dollar per month to the 2524 in the next fiscal year, um, going up to a maximum of 3068 by 2829. And then the last slide here on the rate comparisons, I know there's a lot on there. Um, we tried to put, or we did put all of the agencies in Orange County there. So the first yellow on the left is showing the 2410 that are the current rates for the district. And then the slightly darker yellow is the 2524. That would be the proposed adjustment for July 1 of this year. Um, so very much within range of all of the other agencies. And the other thing I would just like to point out, this is based on all of the current rates for the agencies. So we are assuming that um, all of these agencies will also build in an annual adjustment starting the next fiscal year, but we didn't have that data available. So we're just showing the current rates as is, and then the one um, proposed rate for July 1 for the district there. 
So um, in next steps, this is my final slide here. This just gives an overview of the general process in terms of the rate study process. So tonight we're just pr um, providing the preliminary draft um, and soliciting comments, questions, feedback on that. Um, next step would be um, incorporating both the board comments that we received yesterday morning, as well as comments from the committee tonight to uh, provide a final draft study for, for consideration for approval of the report and the proposed rates. Um, once we have that, then the, the staff would be directed to send out the Prop 218 notices. That requires a minimum of a 48-day noticing period before the public hearing could be held to consider and approve the new rates. Um, and then assuming there is no successful challenge of the Prop 218, um, the new rates would be able to be adopted effective July 1 of this year. So again, um, that's just the, the high level overview of the study. So both staff and myself are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, I appreciate the time this evening. Okay. Oh, yeah, I, I figured there would be a lot of questions. Your hand went up first. So okay. let's start with you and then we'll go that way. Okay. Just uh, just probably questions for clarification. What mm -hmm. is the current reserve percentage? And then is that then are you increasing that to a target? Is it 30 percent? You're going to 35 percent or I'm misinterpreting that. Just want to get clarification on the reserve numbers current and then target. Yeah, so that 30% is the minimum reserve target. So currently the district is right at that minimum target level. And so that over the course of the five-year study period, that the 30% of the O&M budget, that number in terms of the real dollar value is going to increase, right? Because the budget is going to increase. But we are rec the current adjustments are recommending that there will be a reserve that is above that min absolute minimum that we recommend. And part of that is to have the opportunity for in the future beyond that five year rate period to be able to either soften or minimize rate increases out projected into the future. And then does that rate, does this rate study incorporate um, any of the anticipated or all of the anticipated, I use that word, anticipated um, capital costs and expenditures, or there's potential other revenue needs or opportunities to support additional capital investments during this period of time? So I'll let Scott um, chime in with additional insight, but we have incorporated all of the known costs at this time that the district is anticipating. So on the solid waste side, we don't have any capital expenses, right? Because right? we don't have trucks. We don't have um, the carts are, do not belong to CNR. It's all belongs. To, um, that's all CNR. So we have no capital expenses. In fact, you might recall um, prior to 2019, we, we stabilized the rates for 10 years, the solid waste rates for 10 years. And that's because we had uh, an abundance of reserves, uh, uh, solid waste reserves, and there was no need for that because we didn't have capital expenses. So we drove that down. We had to have a minimum of $2 million in the bank to help pay for our bills because we get a, a two lump sums uh, a year from the county on the assessments. And so there's that, we call this this dry period where we don't Get, we have minimal revenues coming in, so we got to use some of that the, the fund balance to pay for the bills. But we don't own that. We don't have any capital expenditures, so you'll see. There's I don't think there's any capital expenses in the budget. Verifying that. The last question is just looking at the regional monthly rate comparisons, um, just taking out the proposed, as Jeremy mentioned, that chart's going to change because everybody is going to have to adjust. Rate. Everybody literally is going to have to adjust their rates. Just curious if there's any, any assumptions about some of the neighboring cities, like. Tustin and Irvine, what factors into their costs, which are lower? Irvine served by waste management, Tustin by CRNR. Only the only assumption, and this is something I'm making, is is that I understand all these cities. They also have a commercial side, which we're not responsible for. Okay. And a lot of these cities will um, subsidize the residential through the commercial rates, and that's how they can keep their rates down lower than us. So what you're saying is really a true cost to provide the service. Appreciate that. Thanks. That's all I have. 
Uh, I think you started to touch on this. The um, operation and maintenance costs, uh, since you don't have any solid waste equipment, is that basically just CRNR cost breakdown? What? The operation is, is a lot is consulting services, right? We we do we do uh, hire from consulting services. Um, we do have some minors, maybe some minor supplies uh, for staff. Um, I don't know. Can you think of any other means? Yeah, it, it a number of things. So, for example, when we conduct the solid waste rate study, all the costs that go into that and sending out the notice, that would be in the operations and maintenance maintenance costs. When we conduct the community survey, a portion of that comes out of um, this fund, and then miscellaneous projects, as well as staffing costs. Okay, uh, so like the million bucks for landfill, that's just um, not just it's it's cost for studies and evaluation. So that would just be the operations and maintenance portion that's outlined in the um, chart. Right. That would be the cost that I just mentioned, and then recycling, landfill, organics. Um, that would be the CRNR costs. Uh, that's what I was getting. Okay, so essentially the O and M breakdown, occupancy landfill, recycling, organic, so those are sort of a breakdown of CRNR's costs that pass those through to us. Those particular line items, yes, yeah. or the cost we pay to CRNR. And then the, um, and we talked a little bit about the um, the bank, <laughs> what do we call it? The, uh, the reserve. The reserves. Mm -hmm. um, that is just to cover bills. That's, there's no other infrastructure than it's, it's the reserves not to, for big capital investment, big capital improvements. Not really. right? okay. Thank you. That's all. But the expenses that are listed under CRNR, the CPI increases that are optional, I think it's every other year or at the end of the year, every year, that is not included, right? Because you can't budget for something that the board doesn't approve. So that gets paid in real time. So that would be an additional cost not covered under that, correct? That's in the projection. Yeah. So we incorporated that per the contract CRNR, they could, um, have an annual adjustment of 5% as a maximum. So we included that in the financial projections in order to be conservative enough because you don't want to under collect your rate revenue over the course of the five year period. Okay, perfect. But it does like, I mean, it, the, the board has the option to approve a lower amount if they want to. Right. So, so, but it is, we we're assuming the board's going to approve 5%. Okay. One of the, if I could just throw one more thing into that, some of the costs, I think we're still looking at what 1383 is going to cost us, right? So some of that has to be in there, even the even the educational component that I think we're trying to make as strong as it can be. So I'm not sure we have all the total costs, what 1383 is going to, how that's going to affect us, but that's, I assume, included in, in that as well. Those are probably the first, the front-loaded costs. And then probably softer costs moving forward for some ongoing for the next few years for some ongoing work, but not at the level mm -hmm. that you would front load to get everybody to comply earlier on. Yeah, really good point. I mean, that the front loading costs are are the major ones for us. Jeff, were you done with your questions for yes, now? Thank okay. you. Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess the first question I have is for Jeremy. Jeremy, does Proposition 218 prohibit uh, subsidizing one customer's rates uh, by another customer? Yeah, so you have to demonstrate the specific cost basis on how you arrive at the rates amongst the customer classes. So for each customer class, you have a specific net revenue requirement, and then that will be what you need to collect the in terms of the rates amongst those different customer classes. Um, I think, is this question related to different agencies that have commercial service? Is that kind of what you're getting at in terms of why those residential rates may be a little bit lower? No, just the, um, I guess, early on in your report, you talk about um, equity. Mm -hmm customers paying for the services that they're receiving. So mm -hmm. I know I'm thinking about this uh, in relations in relation to services provided. So mm -hmm. if I have smaller, what is it, 35 or 36 gallon carts and my neighbor has 90 gallon carts, you know, one would think that I would be paying less than my neighbor would be paying. 
Sure. Yeah. And one of the, oh, well, let's got, um, who are you trying to chime? Uh, yeah. That was actually discussed a little bit yesterday at the, at the board meeting. Um, talk about variable rates. And I'm a firm believer that variable rates should apply in solid waste. Uh, it should be treated just like any other utility, uh, like water or, or, or gas. And the more you, you use, the more you're going to pay. Uh, unfortunately, um, we're just not there yet. I, I do plan on bringing this to the board, maybe within the next five years, possibly. But we need to get um, make sure we can be able to, uh, because they're going to be now. They're going to be. We're talking three different types of rates. We got to be sure we can charge the uh, resident the right rate, and we're going to make sure we can capture those, those revenues. So we're just not there yet. So, but that's hopefully in the future, near future. Is it because the district doesn't have the right computer system to account for that, or is it CRNR, or is it both? Both, I would say. Because I know we've had this conversation before about why not tiered rates. And I know before it was because we would have no way of knowing what anybody had because it was kind of a mishmash. But now that we're going to where everybody's cans are going to be accounted for, it would theoretically be it, it will help. the ideal time yes. to charge people appropriately based on the size. And that was actually one of the uh, questions I had for Jeremy of all the um Sorry to jump in, but it's tied into what you're talking about. Um, of all the agencies that you've done this for, and I don't know how many it is, um, if it's all the ones that you have listed here, how many of them are actually tiered based on the size of their cart? Yeah, I would say that it's really agency dependent. So as Scott noted, it depends on, on the admin side, right? The ability to actually implement rates on a cart size basis. Um, so amongst residential customers, there are agencies that do charge a different rate based on the size of the cart, whether it's 90, 65, or 35. But there's also agencies that view that as a single service, right? In terms of you could get up to a 90 gallon cart essentially as part of the standard service so that there's a flat rate for all the residential customers. So it's really oh, just get, agency I dependent. Mm -hmm. I was just curious, like out of all the agencies you deal with, is it 50% of them? Is it like 60% of them? Is it 10% of them? Like vault, like do you have a estimate of how many people, how many agencies are actually tiered versus flat rate? That's the question I'm asking. Yeah, I don't know that I could really put a specific percentage to it. Um, we see both, though, I would say. We see both either a flat rate for your residential or based on the container size. I don't believe any agencies in Orange County has tier rates. Now, I do know the previous employee I worked City of Claremont, we did have tier rates. And the reason why they were able to make that work is because they did all the billings themselves in the finance department, so it was easy to track who had what, and, and, and Claremont had their own trash areas. The, the city employees picked up the trash, not mm -hmm. smaller. So it was easy for them to track it. It was right. very easy to track. So that one city that I'm aware of that does tier, but in Norris County, I'm not aware of any cities that tiers. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Okay, Rosemary. Well, I just wanna say that I'm very interested in having customers have the ability to pay for the services they provide. Because if I went to a gas station and I paid like on average what everybody uses when they fill up their gas tank, I'd have a Prius. So I'd be kind of upset about paying for gas that I'm not using. That, to me, that's an obvious example. I do understand how um, a system can get to this place, but I think it definitely should be a priority um, to move to that um, um paradigm where people are paying for based on the size of their carts and the, I agree with and the you service that I they're receiving. I, agree with I, you. I, I just want to say that. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, comment on was the reserves. Um, I don't know how I feel about 30%, 30 but I also don't feel good about not having an upper or a a higher end on those reserves, like, oh, we don't want to be at the bare minimum. So if the target is 30%, then we should be at 30%. I don't, I don't feel good about just collecting all this money and holding it in reserves to, um, I do like to like smooth out some of those rate increases, but I don't want to collect so much money that we're really digging in the pockets of our customers and, you know, not that it's happening at this agency, but, you know, the way reserves can be used um, can also help 
cloud, even the way a, a system is being run or the financial um, integrity. And so I, I wouldn't want us to be in that situation either. So either we have a like, hey, we're going to have our reserve target is 30% and that's where we're going for, or we're going to be from, you know, 20 to 28%. You know, that's our range that we're shooting for, but I'd, I'd like to have an upper end also. And then lastly, I have some other additional questions, but maybe I think you'd be able to help me understand a couple of the charts afterwards. Thank you. Vicki, did you have anything? I guess I'm also trying to understand the reserves. I keep hearing this 30 and 35%, and maybe I don't understand it, but when I look at this chart, it's like the reserve is double what the minimum is. It, and I don't, because I don't, yeah, that that just doesn't, it seems like it keeps going up and it's not even close to. Can you explain that? Yeah. It's like double the minimum. Yeah. Can you explain that chart, Jeremy? Yeah. Yeah. So that green line is the minimum reserve target. So that's the lower bound, the absolute minimum that would be the cash on hand in terms of the reserves. Um, so that's currently where the utility fund is at the moment in terms of that reserve. So based on the district adopting the 5% adjustment every year, this would build up the reserve above that minimum floor target, right? And so the idea of building up this reserve is there's actually there's a number of reasons. Um, one reason is, and I'll flip back to the, um, the financial plan here. So if you look at the net revenue requirement and then two uh, rows below that, the annual surplus slash deficit with the rate increases. In 24-25, um, it's the 969K, but you could see over the course of the five-year period, that number is shrinking. And so the amount that's being set aside to reserves is shrinking over time. So we don't only look necessarily at the five-year period, we're looking at the 10-year, 20-year horizon. And so over in the outer years, that number is actually going to go negative. So even at a 5% increase every year, that's eventually your the expenses are going to outstrip the sources of revenue at a 5% increase. So part of the rationale for building up a reserve slightly above what the minimum floor would be was projecting out over the 10-year horizon, the 20-year horizon, so you don't have to see a, a substantial spike in the rates in the outer years. You could use some of that reserve, draw it down in order to keep a flat 5% over the outer years as well in order to help keep pace with those expenses rather than having a, a more significant rate increase out in the future. Does that make sense? I think all of us are kind of drilling down on the same point here is we're looking at this big increase over, you know, the 5% over the next four years, five years. And it's in anticipation of increases that will come later. So those increases don't have to be paid for by the customer. It can be mitigated by the district. But the bottom line is, is that the customer is getting hammered now for, for costs in the future that may or may not happen. And um, my question is actually, the district hadn't raised its rates in many years. And then you guys had to, because you, you had been covering the rate in increases. But from like 2018 to current, was, hasn't there been three rate increases? Yes, from, from 2019 to current, there's been five, okay. five rate increases. Okay, so there's been five. And now there's five more. And my concern, in addition to collecting extra money that technically isn't needed, if it's going to be used in the years moving forward, is in line with what she was talking about, where we're hammering everybody equally. And I'm saying hammering, like you have to cover your costs, but that's how people look at it. Like you give them a bill that's higher and they feel like they're being hammered by everybody. But we're spreading the increase out to everyone equally when, you know, we have like the little old man that lives by himself that barely has one little tiny bag of trash and he's paying the same as his next door neighbor that has the maximum, you know, they have full 90 gallon trash cans. And that 
Like that's a lot of expense to put on an aging demographic like we have in this city or like Rosemary said, we're subsidized. We're, we're paying for other people's trash essentially. But, so what I'm hearing from the citizens vice community and we can um, tell Jeremy to, to work the numbers again and we can share uh, the, your comments with the board uh, is that you want us to look at lowering the, the proposed rate where you don't have a substantial increase in the reserves, right? Just you want to make make fairly commit like keep our minimal amount and that's it. I well, you know, the interesting thing that we're, something that Jeremy said really made me think about these reserves because if we're collecting all these reserves now to pay for like far out future um rates or to like level that out, today's customers are subsidizing our future customers. So there it's like this fine line and this dance. And you know, I'm looking at that bottom line of the cumulative rate increases. That 27.6, as shocking as it sounds, does not seem unreasonable. You've got a lot of services, you've got a lot of regulations. That number hurts my heart but I think it's a reasonable number. I, I already said my piece about, um, you know, equity and Prop 218, um, but just to really take a, a you know, a, a, I guess sharpen the pencil on that reserve to really think about definitely having that reserve because you need it to protect your system and your customers, um, but you don't want it to be so free flowing that, <laughs> Or like Starbucks, where people have all that money in the app, and Starbucks is making a lot of money on interest because they're a lot of their customers' money. Um, so we want to be reasonable, is what I'm saying. I, I think I understand what the, the citizen vice president is suggesting or recommending. Uh, I mean, go back with my staff. We'll meet with my staff and Jeremy, and, and we can present to the board another um, option uh, based on what you're you're saying saying to us, commenting to us. So. Mm -hmm. And Scott, if you don't mind, I, I'd be mind if I just chime in with one additional thought on that piece. Um, yeah, so the the one thing that I do want to point out is these um, in setting the rates, that 5% annual adjustment is really setting a ceiling, a maximum that can be adjusted up to that amount. Each year, it's up to the board's discretion to set a number up to 5% or something less than that 5% that's listed in the rate table. Um, and so that is obviously per the discretion of the board, but also is going to be influenced by those CRNR um, annual adjustments as well. So um, just because you're setting those ceilings at the 5% number each year, does not necessarily mean that that has to be adopted, say, in the outer years of the study, say, in 27, 28, or 28, 29. If the reserves are healthy, it is up to the discretion of the board. They can adopt something less than that maximum amount. But when it's noticed, to, it has to be noticed to the public, and it would be noticed to the public as a maximum of 5% over the period. And then if the board decided to make it lower, it would be lower, but it would have to be presented like this up front because it's not going to be noticed every year. It's going to be noticed now for through 2029. Right, because we're proposing right. a rate increase of five years. And if, okay. If you're not doing a rate increase or doing, if, if you're keeping rates stabilized or you're going to lower the rate, Prop 218 does not come in play. It's only when you're raising the rates. So right. Jeremy said, you get it all, get it all the way. Do, you, do your rate increase five years and on the third or fourth year, we bring a budget to the board and say, look, we are our, our reserves are where we're at. We don't need to increase it the way you adopted years ago. Here's our recommendation, and they can do that. No Prop 218 hearings required. It's done. And that is why you see this is more conservative than not, because as Scott said, you have to go back through the Prop 218 noticing and approval if you want to increase those rates beyond what the maximums are listed in the table. Whereas if you're going for something that is less than the maximum that's already been noticed, you don't have to go through that entire process again. So would these rates that are being collected, like is, is okay, let's say you stick to the percent across the board and you have this 
built up reserve. It has the money that's been collected for this. Can it only be used to offset the cost of trash later, or can it be commandeered and used for something completely? just reserve across the board, or does it have to be used for it has to be specific used to stall waste? It has to be okay. the enterprise funds so that has to be used specifically to stall. Okay, so the like, okay, so the board can say, oh, well, let's use money for this. So okay, they can the enterprise fund specifically for what it's perfect. Anybody else questions, comments? I guess one one quick question um, to finish me off is is um, I noticed that, that the extra cart charge was sort of flat across the whole board for the whole years. Is there any factor of inflation or anything that could, that should increase over time? Like just like the rate increases over yeah, time. We, it, it's not a it's it's there are not a lot of third carts out there, and so I. As long as and, and CNR didn't seem to have an issue with, as long as they were you know recouping right. the cost, it, it seems to be fine. But uh, you're right; it has it has. I think we raised it once since I've been here. I think at one time it used to be eight dollars. We raised it nine dollars in the last ten years. A couple houses in my track. I don't know why they have like ten carts. I don't know what's going on there, but <laughs> everybody's track. I think I don't know if they're group homes or what's going on there, but there's a lot of trash cans. <laughs> I have curiosity uh, in terms of like, I don't know how many vehicles or fleet vehicles you have. Is that all uh, covered under um, costs related to the sewer um, or the, the, the sewer? Or trash, right? Yeah, but all all the all the fleet that's um, that CNR uses to for the service, it's in in the rate. Right, I meant um, Costa Mesa sanitary sanitation. So we have no solid waste fleet. Uh, it's, all, it's all wastewater fleet. I'm just thinking, even trucks and maintenance trucks, stuff like that, is all is that all um, just for your uh, wastewater? Um, <clears throat> just to, the, just the co-enforcement vehicle. Vehicle. That vehicle out there. That's the only one that's used. Yeah. Okay. And that's included. Yeah. Got it. Okay. That's all. All right. So we, we don't have folks in the field doing stuff. Just, just code enforcement. Yes. That's it. All right. Yeah. Thanks. But just uh, remind me, I should know this, but <laughs> just remind me of the, the, the 218 process. If there's a challenge um, to, to that, where does that process end when you uh, end up when you, um, if there is a challenge, how is that adjudicated? Okay, so so the Prop 218, we have to, in order for to the rate increase not to go in effect, we need 50% plus 0.1 uh, of uh, protests. So out of 23,000 homeowners that you're talking 13,000 protests. And in the past, I think the most we've got were a dozen, you know, so it's it's very minimal. Video? Yeah. That answers all of Thank them. you very much. It's a good discussion. And this, um, this is why we have this, this committee, because this is good information for us. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for the presentation and the information. I really appreciate all the comments, the feedback, and discussion. And thanks again to Scott and Marissa for the invitation this evening. It was a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. I guess technically we should have opened yeah. public comment after each item. Or and you want, Mr. Marshall, it, do you have comments? Did you have any comments or questions? I apologize for not asking you. We very rarely get in-person guests here. <laughs> but you always have good some good questions. I don't want to skip you. Yeah, I just uh, my name is Jim Mosher. I'm a, actually a resident of Newport Beach, but I am in the Costa Mesa Sanitary District sewer service area. So I have only an indirect interest in this. I guess the one clarifying question, I think I know the answer, uh, but if these are, as Jeremy said, these are ceilings on what the rate is and the board chose not in some of the five years to make the increase, do they reserve the discretion at the end of the five years to jump to that final rate or is it year by year that they have to make the decision? That's a great question. Great question. So. Uh, for each fiscal year, the maximum ceiling is the number that is set in that rate notice. So um, it is possible, say, if you did not 
increase rates for the first four years, so you are still at the $24, the board could adopt anything up to that maximum set in 28-29 of around $30. They could adopt that number or anything less than that per the rate notice. That was a great question. Thank you for asking it. Yeah. Anybody else comments, questions? So what one question myself. Uh, mm -hmm. see here after 10 years, if you do keep that five percent increase, do I read it right that there there'll be a an annual deficit of a quarter of a million dollars? Let me see. I have to look at the 10 year projection here. Um, so based on a 5% annual by 3334, so again, that's pretty far out to project costs, but at the 5% annual, that would be a deficit of uh, 267K by that year. So that's again part of the reason why we were trying to smooth out these increases and build up some of the reserve targets in order to keep that that smooth 5% increase over the 10 year period. So you are positive through year number eight and after year eight, you go into a deficit. That's what the projections show. I'm not sure I could say that I'm positive that eight years from now, the exact budget figures will be what we projected based on, you know, inflation factors and all of that. But that's what the projection is showing based on the best available information. Yeah, no, I mean, you're positive as far as the information shows a positive. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, year eight. Yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood the question. Yes. Um, the annual surplus deficit with the rate increases shows it, um, that num the sources of funds um, being less than the uses of the funds in 32-33. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so we'll be back looking at these numbers in 2029 for fiscal year 2029. Uh, so typically, you would want to start the process again about three to four years out, right? So in order to have it in place for the end of the five-year period. So, And certainly, we recommend that the district is reviewing these annually, right, to make sure that the budget, the projections are all keeping pace with what we envision in the financial plan that was developed. you very much thank you good comments thank you all right thank you um i guess we'll go on to item number three mitigating odors at eldon and president pump station yeah. thank you madam chair so the orders we're talking about you know the wastewater odors is that that rotten egg smell Sometimes you get when you if you're near a pump station or there might be some standing water in in a any any manhole and so we have 20 stations. The so two stations that seem to be prevalent with, with odors is, is Eldon, which is located on Mesa Drive, right adjacent to um, uh, Santa Ana Country Club. And that's where we're getting the complaints is from the, the golfers <laughs> because the wind kind of blows in that direction. So we get the, the complaints from the golfers. And then the other other station is President uh, Station, which is it's off President, um, um, what's it, President uh, not Drive, is it President Drive? Sir, I think it's part of the circle, and it's in a it's in a, a alley um, right to an entrance to um, Fairview Park, and there's a home literally I mean, like 15 feet adjacent to that to that um, station, and that person will co complain or, or let us know that the odors are are strong um, at that station. So typically, how we mitigate odors at stations, we we, we will clean the wet wells on a regular basis. Uh, we, we install odor loggers. Um, at Eldon, we'll, we'll do a downspout. It's another, like another uh, water spout that goes into the station and making sure that the, the water at the bottom of the well keeps turning because it's all that slime. When that slime at the bottom of the wet wells builds up and it remains stable, that's where you get that odors. So we want to make sure the water keep, keeps turning. But we still, as you said, we're still getting um, some odor issues, as you indicated in the report. And so we implemented something different at the two stations. And if you know, they're on the pictures are these um, charcoal canisters. And basically what it is, charcoal in, in these canisters. And, and you can see there is, um, it's, it's hooked up to our station and then um, 
it uh, the the odor as opposed to the smoke is comparable. It's basically the clean air that's coming out here. Um, it's, it appears to be working um, fairly well, um, but we're going to wait and see in the summer months. Uh, that's usually when we get the odors is, is in the summer when it's really hot outside. Um, but so far, it, it seems to be working. Uh, another um, um, method for um, controlling odors is ventilations. Um, we used to have uh, really bad odors at South Coast Plaza, and we installed a, a ventilation stack way above the parking structure. So once we did that, the, the, the complaints went away. Uh, we're trying to we're going to consider uh, increasing the stacks at Eldon and at um, President Pump Station. Also, the fan uh, a fan is very useful for um, pushing the the, the the air away uh, or these the odors away. Um, unfortunately, the fan at Eldon has been has been um, um, broken for some time. So so um, engineering department is in the process of designing the fans. We think when when that's in operation, that's going to greatly improve the odors at Eldon. So. Um, just wanted to give you a heads up. This is what this so this is what we're planning on doing for um, Eldon and President Pump Station. So far, so good. But uh, um, wanted to share that with you and you have, have any comments you might have. So, with my presentation, um, I have a question. I'm, I might be confusing items because I don't have it in front of me. I'm a little bit brain dead right now. But are these the ones that cost like five? It would cost like five thousand dollars a year to replace. It's, it's it's like a ninety thousand dollar budget. Yeah. Do you like the bigger yes. ventilation replacement? It's like sixty thousand dollars to replace. But if you limp along with these, they're good essentially for a year. But it's about a five thousand dollar cost yeah. for both. for both of yeah. them. Yeah, about three hundred dollars. Yeah, so it's five thousand dollars a year. Yes, correct. Okay. So, like, at what point would you guys decide that the five thousand dollar a year option isn't? good enough if it's working to well, I, go to the it, next level or yeah, it, it, hope it, this works and you stick with this. Yeah. Well, I mean, also we get still get numerous complaints from, from the golfers and from um, uh, the, the, the homeowner or president, then we're, we know, okay, we got to go to plan B. This is not working. Um, and so um, that will be including um, increasing the, the ventilation stack, putting the fan in. Um, I, I know, I don't think it's, OC um, OC San they they use chemicals we have they do they actually have a a, um, a dowsing um, um, station at um, Mendoza it's a big station where they're where they're pumping chemicals into their trunk line that seems to be very effective but it's also extremely expensive um, I don't think we have any room to do put chemicals in our system like that um, uh, so uh, we'd have to go back to the drawing boards and see what we can do if, if this is not working. But if you had to go like the $60,000 route, would it be for both total or? No, it would be 6, just for Eldon. Eldon, because that's our largest station, that seems to be more, the most prevalent oh. one. So we would spend the money on Eldon. No, no, so, um, we just we, we just um, upgraded the present pump station. You know, we spent over $2 million upgrading that station. And so um, I think we've done, the only thing we, we could probably do is raise the ventilation stack higher. I think that's one thing we could do at present station. But other than that, there's, I don't know what else we can do. Yeah, questions, I just wanted to say I, I walk by there multiple times a week and it doesn't smell. All right. On on um president. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. So um hopefully this will rectify the issue. Yeah, thank you. But I'm there regularly and it's it's beautiful and it does not smell. Right, my bike has smelled quite a bit, and yeah, it does on occasion yeah. have a pretty sour odor. I like I said it, it almost smells like you know H2S or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I just I don't know your system, and I don't know if that was kind of a a wall in the line or kind of a low point or something, and, and didn't know if chemicals might be an answer for that. But obviously, if that's expensive, I don't know if like an upstream tote or something might. Well, if you do smell through things right? along there, because it's it's the pump station, but it's also you can smell it at every manhole, kind of along that that mesa. We did drive. seal we did seal some manholes mm -hmm. to try to prevent that. Um, so. Um, but if you're still smelling it, uh, again, we can it's on occasion, you know, it's, it's summertime's worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I imagine at some point they all stink a little bit once in a while. Like the one it's, on Sandman, yeah. Chrysler, like every once in a while. That yeah. Yeah. Over exactly. by the fairgrounds on fair or like the entrance into the into the fairgrounds, like because I walk around there and every once in a while it's like, oof. But so I have a pump station on my property right, at my see, house. You have one at your house. And we don't. Did you get a deal on that? <laughs> I'm still negotiating. I've been there 40 years. So. Um, 
I've never really noticed the smell. Okay, what I've noticed more are these tiny little black fly grease flies, right? Yeah. Uh, but the smell now. Some of my neighbor there. There's a group of um, ladies that meet on Thursday evening, and they sit out on Florida Avenue and probably drink a little wine. But they they've been talking a lot to OC Sam about smells that are coming over the riverbed. And OC Sam's done a marvelous job of mitigating that. So there are ways to do it. But in terms of a smell, maybe it's the cigars I smoke out in the garage that mask the smell. But I killed everything. I've been to your garage. Believe me. Believe me. Oh, right by on my bike. You know, the other thing, I, based on these poor golfers at Santa Ana Country Club, I'm going to start blaming every crappy shot that I hit on the golf course on some sewer smell. I mean, uh, we need to make sure the Santa Ana Country Club golfers are taken care of. Right, Scott? Yeah. Okay. Neighbors. Hey, Scott, out of, out of curiosity, the, um, the exhaust fan replacement, do you know what the life expectancy is? No, I don't. Okay. I don't know that. I'm sorry. Just thinking out loud about, you know, the cost effectiveness of your canister solution on an annualized basis versus... Oh, okay. Just fans last a long time. Ten years, I don't know, but I'll consult with Mark on that. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So you'll let us know. Sure. With us. Okay. Uh, Permanent generator at Harbor Pump Station. Tony, can you pull up that picture for me, please? So, if you're, so if you're familiar with our our pump station at. Harbor. So here's here's Wilson. Here's Harbor. Uh, our pump station is is right there. It's our second largest station in the system. It pumps 1,600 gallons per minute, and as you can see, it is extremely dense. Um, you got homes here, businesses here. Um, there really is no place to put a generator unless we're going to have to put it on private property somewhere. We you know maybe here in the parking lot. Uh, we did reach out to the property owner here, and and they ignored us. Um, had no, nothing to do about it. We considered maybe putting it across the street, whatever the case, it's definitely got to go on prior property. And so that's going to take some more discussion. Um, and, and if it comes down to possible imminent domain, hopefully that's come down to that. But that's, that's still down in the future. But what, what we were wanting to, what we had discussion with the board and what we want to discuss with the citizen advisory committee is, is the, is the type of generator. Because it's so dense there, we really don't want to put a diesel generator there. In addition to that, um, AQMD, um, is put a lot of pressure on agencies on using um, alternative uh, generators. Um, they, they, uh, in fact, um, they're making it very hard to getting permits now for any kind of new generators. Um, so the option really is is uh, natural gas, which we do have one generator hooked up on natural gas, and and it, because we do that, it's because it's a highly dense area. It's in that, um, um, it's on the Irvine pump station in that um, Back Bay shopping shop, shopping mall. It's actually in the mall underneath the. Um, uh, uh, carport. So that's our natural gas generator. The other option we were looking at is is hydrogen or or fuel cell. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, we and almost Dickie, you know anything about it? We don't know any waste water agencies are using that type of technology. And quite frankly, I don't think the technology is there yet for for the pump stations. Um, they do make hydrogen um, generators, but it's just um, Mark feels our engineer feels it's just it's just not very reliable at this point with um, um, the pump station. So we did present this to, to the board, and the board did suggest us consider looking at a natural gas generator uh, at this location. Um, the big question, as I mentioned, is where do we put it? That's going to be the big challenge. But here to um, just share that with the CAC and, um, and see if you um, agree. Uh, should we continue with the, the uh, natural gas generator, or should we look further into um, – other alternatives um, like like hydrogen. So, natural gas generators seem to make the most sense. Um, I know the yeah. that open up like a whole different can of worms with transporting and storing and all of that. And yeah. it isn't something that people are doing at this point. Um, doesn't that also rely on electricity? 
I mean, this is, this is just a standby, right? Yes, standby. And yeah. for and how long? What are you powering, and how long do you need? To well, it it would power if we have um uh, power outages. How about just batteries? Yeah. So we, I mean, we we run half the plant on on batteries. Sometimes we have this kind of it was put in by Edison, and it's a massive power bank, but it it powers a massive amount of stuff. But I mean, Tesla, you can power a car for three hundred miles on a battery pack. That's you know. Not all that big. Well, I mean, you just have it running on, you know, you probably have to cycle it every now and then, but yeah. I mean, it's silent. It's orderless. I will get you information because when I worked on the design of the new Bay Bridge pump station, we looked into what things. Did you go batteries? So I moved to construction before the end of that design, but uh, <laughs> so I don't know what the outcome was, but uh, Rob told us, hey, I want you guys to look into something else besides, you know, diesel. Yeah. So we looked into batteries. Um, I'll I'll check it out and then I'll. Thank I'll, you. you know, yeah. I I didn't I didn't know. Yeah. That's why we have these but, meetings because you get yeah. great ideas. But I did not know that. We, we do you. have a an alternative fuel station, like Dean is saying, with two million Tesla batteries. No, you, yes, I know you have the, the Tesla batteries there. Yes, yeah. basically just you know you, you charge it up on normal power, and then when the power goes out, the batteries. How long do the, how long the batteries last? Because because sometimes you know because you have to look into the life. Yeah, because the cycle those every now and then. I would assume when we're planning generators, we're planning like what happens if a massive earthquake occurs and we're out of power power for days. What do we do? That's the that's a thing. Then you'd have to maybe have a plug in and you. Yeah, sort of a portable generator or something when you. So my only concern with the gas generator is that what happens if the 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 gas lines disrupted during an earthquake? Then what do you do? Now now you still got to bring a portable generator in. So so there's that that issue too. So um, how much time do you have before you have a problem? Not much. Yeah, it's it's oh, about, really? yeah, it's not very long. So when we when we get a when we get a, a notice of medicine that power outage at the station, my my guys they drop everything and they go get a portable generator. Okay, and they, and yeah, they, that's they go quickly. Yeah, that's that's yeah. This one, this one, we have to move quickly. Or maybe a combination, you know. Maybe maybe the batteries buy you a little time and yeah, pull a generator and plug it in. Oh, well, we'll look into that. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. Scott, the um, not knowing kind of what the size and configuration would be, but just looking at the Irvine pump station, um, gener gas generator is something. If it were a gas generator, you something that of that size dimensions yeah it'd be very similar it'd be very similar to the irvine one absolutely okay absolutely that's a lot of right away it, it is that's a sidewalk yeah no it's it, we there's no room to put on a sidewalk there that's what yeah. we have to that's it's the way. width of essentially probably one of these narrower you know regular sidewalks not the new sidewalks that you're required to have that are exactly. wider exactly who, who are you trying to get property from well, I can't that's part of a bigger I, conversation too like do you go out to this mexican right now or do you go after corporate taco bell like yeah. who who it's host. Well, like, with, I, with, with, the, with, the, with the new North Gate, with the new North Gate, that makes it because you had a business in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> and you notice that breakfast is only served until eleven a.m. at Taco Bell. Right. Really <laughs> there, yeah. The, the the reality of this area is um, it's either a cooperative private property owner or it's eminent domain. That's the only way to accomplish that. There's no city or public right away that's large enough anywhere including those that merge lane can't be the jut uh. oh. yeah. i don't know if it gave you the answer you're looking for it, it gives me another option at least to look at it <laughs> thank you i greatly appreciate that questions comments on item four just one comment that i Support the 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 natural gas generator if you have to go with a yeah you. With a standard at the yeah anyway I know all the problems of the diesel and I do HMD permitting all yeah. day every day so I'm, <laughs> the fuel cell would be great but I think the startup time wouldn't meet your needs to get up and running especially okay. with the one hour yeah. oh really yeah. okay good to know the one hour tipping point okay let's go to um, item number five fiscal year twenty twenty three twenty twenty four work plan. Update. This is just an update of several items that we had in a work plan that uh, I just haven't been able to present to the to, to the CAC, and those items are described in in your staff report. I do want to mention item number three: um, receive and comment on a feasibility study for installing wind turbines 
And when I tell them wind, we're not talking about the wind turbines you see in the desert, not, not those big things. And that's not what I'm talking about. They're, 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 fun. they're smaller, smaller turbines, but I'm always trying to think outside the box what other kind of alternative power we can we can use to save money and, and be more environmentally conscious. So it is one of my performance goals that the board set for me. So I will bring that back to the CC um, at the 24-25 uh, uh, work plan. Okay. Um. Closing items, we have committee member comments. Um, I'll start today. I would like to say thank you because at the last meeting, I had inquired about the um, what the dollar equivalent was to the 5% um, increase for CR&R. And mm -hmm. you guys sent that out to all of us. So hopefully everybody got to see that. And it was still like median in terms of what everybody else pays for their service. So I, I did want to comment on that since I asked. And um, thank you guys for sending out the event list for all the stuff you're participating in. Hopefully people will look at that. And if they're able to volunteer and offer some support as a CAC member, that would be great. Um, and then the other question, I, I, it's more of a question really for you um, than a comment is in theory, um, weren't there supposed to be like a bunch of new applicants for the 2024, 2026 CAC, I was just wondering, like, did you guys get applications? Well, I was gonna, if I was gonna mention that, I was gonna mention that in under staff comments. Uh, thank you, if if it's okay, if I can comment oh, on it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, um, as 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 Chair Lester uh, mentioned, new applicants. There are, <clears throat> excuse me, six seats. There uh, that uh, their terms ex uh, end at the end of today's um, tonight's meeting. Um, and as you know, there are no term limits to um, serve on the CAC. You just got to. Once the term's up, you just submit your application, and then the board will reconsider. Um, as I mentioned, the, those those six um, include um, um, Vice Chair uh, Michael Toe, uh, Rosemary Cora, uh, Dickie Fernandez, Dean Fisher, um, Daniel Baum, and Francesca uh, Normington. Um, Daniel Baum and Francesca Normington did not resubmit applications, and so I want to thank them for their services. This will be their last meetings, and thank them for their services. But for um, um, uh, Vice Chair uh, Tao and, and committee members uh, Cora, Fernandez, and, and Fisher, your application is going to go to the board on, on March 25th for um, consideration. And then we did receive three new applications. Uh, we received one from uh, Paul Lancaster, um, Craig Holmes, and Xerxes Kalilong. I guess how you pronounce it. So those applications will be submitted as well on the 25th. So so if the board approves all eight, we'll have a full full. Um, I would say it'd be six. Well, six. Well, no, it's eight. It'd be um, seven. Seven. Thank you. <laughs> six, seven, eight, seven. I mean, if I could just interject, Scott, Madam Chair, during the meeting, we received an email from committee member um, Francesca Normington officially resigning from her position. So we have the vacancy from Annette Watson and Francesca Normington. So now we have an additional vacancy. So that would be for a one-year term ending in 2025. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to um, those that have served and are leaving us. And a huge thank you to those that are served, that are, are serving and want to continue to serve. And I'm hopeful and confident that the board will vote to keep all of you because you, you add so much to the conversation with great questions and comments. And um, I think we have a really good group. Um, and everybody sees things a little bit differently and from a different angle. And, and I love that. So thank you, all of you. But that's, that's all I have. Any, um, any other comments from, um, CAC members? I'll say congratulations on getting applicants. It's clear the city of Costa Mesa <laughs> in their multiple <laughs> emails are still trying to fill some spots. So <laughs> kudos. I just want to say thank you for reminding me to. Oh, yes, thank you. I had no idea it was two years went by that fast. Remind me. Uh, remind me again the um, compost giveaway and shredding event. Still looking for a location. Still looking for a location. But the date. There's still a date. The, a preferred date. If the it date is now TBD, just okay. based on whether or not we're able to lock in a location. Okay. So hang All tight. Right. I'll follow up with you on that one. <laughs> won't do it anymore. We're doing a lot of construction work over there. So they're uh, around that time frame, apparently 
Apparently. Brooklyn College, possibly the city's yard. Orange Coast College seems pretty open to it, I think, right? Maybe. Yeah. Nothing going out of the recycling center. Why can't you do that? <laughs> we are on a wait and see. We will be back with more information. I will say when they did have, because they did have it at OCC one time and the backup of traffic went all the way up Adams to Harbor and it was kind of a big fat mess. So like it would have to be funneled like into the college and around or something as opposed to up Adams because it, it wasn't pretty. Put it in and out on Harvard and Geese. Yeah, they make it like perfect. Well, oh, okay. <laughs> back up, back on the freeway. Harvard and Geese is. I've heard more horns at that, and I go that corner six or seven times a day. About just being facetious, obviously, but compost in and out burgers kind of go together. Mm. So Scott, I just got a text back. It uh, looks like we went with diesel for Bay Bridge. Mm -hmm. But I know we 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 did look into it, so I'm gonna went diesel, huh? Yeah. yeah. We I'll confirm it tomorrow, but I'll get you all the information. I know that we looked into battery. Okay. So whatever information we research, I'll send, share. Send it to Mark Esker. Send, yeah, because uh, I'll let him know that we have discussion. Granted, that's a pretty big pump station. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, that's a board or staff comments for any of us? Not tonight. Okay, our next meeting is May. Six, six, I know. Hold on. I don't think I look on my phone, huh? Second Wednesday. No, May 8th. May 8th. Okay, so the next CAC meeting will be May 8th. And then at that point, we'll have our new people. Yes. And then we'll do the election for chair and vice chair. Correct. Yes. And then and then I'll meet with that chair. Uh, the president and I will meet with the chair. We'll develop a work plan and present it to, to the um, CAC. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, let's adjourn the meeting at 7.16 p.m. Yay for time change. Right. Thank you all. <laughs>